right, where are you? That's a great question, and we're going to get into that in, in just a few moments. But uh, first of all, I just want to welcome you back to church this morning, online family. Welcome you uh, for those who are joining us online this morning or maybe joining us later on through uh, our YouTube channel, watching it later on in the week or however. Um, welcome back to church, first day of the year. Um, you know, last Sunday was Christmas Sunday, and the week before that we had our uh, Christmas at Compassion. So it's, it's kind of been a few weeks since we've had a so-called normal Sunday. But today we're getting back to business. We're gonna we're gonna jump into a new uh, message series in just a moment. But before we do that, you know, we've talked some this morning about today being the first day of the year. And if you've been with me before here at Compassion Danville, when we start the year off, we like to start the year off with 21 days of prayer and fasting. And so maybe you've heard me say that in years past, and, and maybe when you've heard that, maybe even right now, you might have checked out when you heard that thing, yep, not going to do that, not going to do that, not going to do that. Uh, maybe it doesn't make any sense to you. And so here's the thing, man. I, I get it. Let me just explain. Let me just give you just a moment of, of why we do the 21 days of prayer and fasting and what this could look like for you. So I'm not going to take a lot of time on this, but when we fast, what we're doing is we're saying to God that, that I'm going to set aside some time, some time that I normally don't have. And God, I'm coming after you. God, I need more of you in my life. God, I need you to speak to me, to show me. And I want you to always remember, church, we don't tell God our plans and say, bless this. We say, God, you are the Lord of my life. Show me where you want me to go. Show me my direction. If you never get still, if you never get quiet, you never have the opportunity to hear from God. But a time of fasting is a time when you can say, I'm pushing back on all of the noise and I need to get my direction set in this first part of the year. I need to know where God is taking me. And so it's a time to get closer to Him. Um, when you fast for a season, I'm not talking about for a meal or for a day. I'm talking about for a season. When you do that, when you really go after God, I'm telling you this morning, you're going to have the opportunity to experience, God's in way, experience God in ways that you've never experienced Him before. Truth of the matter is, he has things that he wants to tell you. He wants to show you things. He wants to take you on a journey, but we are so busy that we don't make time. And in the hustle and bustle, God gets left on the sideline. Well, for the next 21 days, I'm asking you as a church to go with me on this journey. You say, Jeff, what does that even look like? Are you asking me not to eat for 21 days? Well, that's a great question. And I can see why you might think that, but that's not at all what I'm asking you to do. Matter of fact, I'm dialing this thing way back this year, more than anybody I know that's doing. We just kind of came up with our own thing this year. You say, so what, what exactly are you asking me to do? Well, I'm asking you to set aside the next 21 days, and I'm asking you to make a conscious decision to fast. You have to decide what that looks like for you. In the Bible, when we see fasting, it typically is talking about removing food from your diet. Um, 21 days is a long time. Come on, somebody. Can, I mean, I barely make it through 9 o'clock to 11 o'clock without a bowl of cereal, but whatever. Um, here's what I'm asking you to do. I'm asking you to make a plan. So if we're talking food here, you might want to decide, okay, for 21 days, I'm going to skip one meal a day. That's, that's doable. And in that, in that time, let's say, let's say you, you choose 12 noon is when you would normally eat lunch, and you decide during that time, I'm just going to disappear for a little while. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go and read my Bible, pray, talk, do whatever. I'm going to do that thing, and, and that's what I'm going to do for 21 days. Maybe you decide that I'm only going to eat one meal a day, and I'll fast the other two. That's totally between you and God. Uh, there's a fast called the Daniel Fast, very popular this time of year. It comes from Daniel, a prophet in the Old Testament, and Daniel for 21 days. Uh, I won't tell the whole story. You can read it yourself, but for 21 days, he only ate things that came out of the ground. So, so you're essentially doing away with the sweets and the meats, and you're eating uh, fruits and nuts and berries and vegetables. That's okay. If that's what you choose to do. There is a liquid fast where you only drink liquid. There, there's all kinds of fasts that you can do. Hear me say this. I'm not concerned about the details of it. That's between you and God. What I am concerned about is that we as a church go on this journey for 21 days together. Now, we have written uh, a little daily guide for you. It's called Flexible Fast. Uh, we as a staff wrote this Flexible Fast 
and there's a QR code right here. So if you want to pull out your phone right now, open up your camera app on your phone. If you point your camera at that QR code, it's going to take you to CompassionDanville.com forward slash 21 days. When it takes you to CompassionDanville.com forward slash 21 days, you're going to see there's a place where you can click a link to download uh, the Flexible Fast Guide, or you can just read it right there on our website, CompassionDanville.com. This guide that you're going to open up, is it's, it's our own guide, and we want it to be fun. We want it to be engaging. It's not just something that you read. There's going to be challenges. There's going to be uh, some goofy things in it. There's going to be some things that require It's going to take you on a journey. And so when we start talking about where are you, I want to ask you to just say, if I don't know where I am, I'm going on a journey, and I'm going to start with this fast, and I'm going to let God show me where he wants me to go. It's a flexible fast. Um, the key to this fast, and please hear me say this, the key to this fast is that we as a church do this together. We choose to do this together. Men, women, teenagers, I'm asking every one of you, whether you eat, don't eat, that's between you and God. I don't really care about that as much as I care about you taking this flexible fast guide. Do it every day and watch and see if God doesn't do amazing things in your life. I believe he's going to blow through some things, break open some things. I think he's going to tear down some doors, and I think he's going to open some doors that some of you have been trying to get into for a long time. So that's the, that's the flexible fast. I want to pray over you right now as we begin this fast today, and let's see where God takes us. Father, I just pray right now as we come before you, you have challenged us to do this. You have invited us to your table. And at your table, God, you're going to give us food that we know nothing of. You're going to give us something that's way better than food for our bodies. You're going to nourish our souls. Lord, I pray for this church. God, you know the folks who are sitting here right now who need a breakthrough. There's something that they've been beating their head against for years, and this fast may be the answer to that. God, I pray for folks in this church that have never known what it was like to have a personal relationship with you. And as they engage this fast, maybe for the first time or for the first time in a long time, they're going to hear your voice speaking inside of their spirit, and they are going to come alive. God, you're going to help us to break through and, and put sins that have, have lingered in our lives. You're going to help us to kill those things, and you're going to help us to come alive to the purpose and the adventure that you created us for. So, Lord, now today, as we begin, help us. Help us to encourage each other and help us to be pleasing to you in everything that we do. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. I'll give Steve a big hand. He's been playing a long time up here. Good job, buddy. Thanks for hanging in there with me. <laughs> All right. So, so we're starting a series today called, Where Are You? And I think that's a great question. Matter of fact, I had a conversation with a buddy of mine in the lobby this morning, and he just said, kind of, that's where I am. I don't even know that he knew that's where we were going today, but he said, I just need to know where I am, and I feel stuck, and I want to get going, and I'm trying to find direction for my life. And maybe you feel like that this morning. Maybe you feel like, and let me, let me just talk to men especially for just a minute. Because church can be a thing that, that men come into and there's pink carpet and there's flowers and trees and men are like, yeah, my wife's dragging me to church, blah, 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 we just go to church. Well, what about if men got focused on being the men that God created us to be? Like read through the Bible and you see men in the Bible that were mighty men of valor. You see men who were warriors. What if the men of God decided that, that yeah, I'm going to go to church, I'm going to be a part of the church, but I'm going to live out the things that God has built into me. Well, how do you do that if you don't even know who God is? How do you step into the purpose and the adventure that God has created you for? Men, women, teenagers, children, how do you step into that if you don't know who God is, if you don't have a clear picture of who he is, and if you don't know where you are? And so if you don't know where you are, I want you, as we go through these 21 days, as we go through this series of messages called Where Are You? I want you to ask yourself the question, where am I? Where am I with God? Like, like, I've been living all these years, and am I on track with where God wants me to be? Am I completely lost? What, what's my next step? What's my next step? What's my next step? I would ask every one of you over the next few weeks, over the next few days, over the next few moments even, to ask God, what is my next step? And don't sit through this message today from a standpoint of thinking, I'm just going to listen 
Let's be active. Let's engage here, and let's be thinking about what is my next step. I want you, when you leave here today, to know what your next step is. If you don't know what it is today, then make sure you get back here next week. And, and over the course of the five weeks of January, it should become very clear to you where you are and what your next step is. Don't get stagnant doing God's work. Don't get, don't get stuck. Don't keep doing the same things over and over because God constantly wants to take you into deeper waters. He wants to take you to higher places. He wants to do more things in your life. Where are you? Where are you? Well, I believe that every person on the planet is in one of four categories. One of four categories. You've got to figure out where you are. But my four categories, I just came up with this. I say I came up with it. I feel like God showed this to me a couple of years ago. You've heard me say it lots of times. Every person is either lost or you're saved, or you're a disciple, or you're a disciple maker. Now, in the Great Commission, Jesus said, go make disciples. As Christians, we should all be making our way as quickly as we can to becoming disciple makers. But if you've never been saved, then you've got some work to do on the front end of it. And so we'll talk about what a disciple and a disciple maker and all of that is uh, later on. But this morning as we begin, as we talk about what it means to be lost, I want you to wrestle with a question today. And I'm not talking, you, it's easy for people who've been going to church for a long time to check out on this question. I want you to wrestle with this question. Look at the person beside you and say, he's talking about you. Just tell him, right? He's talking about you, right? I want you to wrestle with this question this morning. Where am I? Am I saved? H have I been saved? Because, because Paul said, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And, and, and let me just say this to set things up. Don't just, don't just assume that you're saved, that you've been not lost, but now you're found. Don't just assume that because you go to church. Don't assume that you've been saved because mama was a Christian and grandma taught Sunday school. And, and like, like, like if I were to ask you the question, uh, when, when, when were you saved? When did you step into a relationship with Jesus? If your answer is, well, I've just always been saved, I don't agree with that. I love you, but I don't agree with that. Because I believe from what I see in the Scriptures that every person has to come to a point in our lives where, where the Holy Spirit of God pursues us, reveals our sin to us, convicts us of our sin, and then God presents us with a choice. I paid the price for your sin at the cross of Calvary, and, and it's up to you. Are you going to accept me and let me be the Lord of your life, and then I lead and you follow, or are you going to reject me and just keep being the Lord of your own life? I believe every person has to come to a point where you're faced with that decision. And sometimes you get faced with that decision, and, and you can dumb this thing down and decide, well, I'm going to go to church, I'll be a good person. But you never really get off the throne and let Jesus be the Lord of your life. Have you stepped down from the throne of your life? Are you allowing God to lead and you follow him? A lot of folks, man, one of my biggest fears as a pastor one of my biggest fears as a pastor is that day when we get to heaven and people who have sat in these pews, in these chairs, get to heaven with thoughts that I've been saved because I've been a good person, because I've went to church. That's not it. Salvation comes when we give our lives to Christ and we begin to follow him. Um, second thing I want you to think about today, two things. One, I want you to chew on your own salvation. Do I know that I've been saved? Do I know that? Am I sure of that? And second, if you are sure of that, then as you listen today, I want you to ask God to reveal people to you in your life that you know are not walking with him. Be bold enough to say, God, show me the people in my life that are lost, that you want me to have a personal relationship with, and that you want me to, to speak into their life and, and maybe have a part in leading them to know you. That's what Christians do. We care about other people. We go after the lost. We help them to find Jesus. We set them up to be disciples, and then we go get another one. You say, how do you know that, Jeff? This is what Jesus did. That's what Jesus did. Look at Luke 15, verses 1 through 7. Beautiful story here in Luke 15. It's a story from the life of Jesus. It says, now the tax collectors and the sinners. Now, now just stop, just a little context here. Tax collectors were hated people in, in Jesus' world. In most cases, these were Jews who were collecting taxes from the Roman people, and so they were taking money from their own people and giving it to the hated Roman government. The people despised the tax collectors. The sinners were just people. I mean, come on. If you hear the word sinner, what do you think of? It's people who are having nothing to do with God's way and God's law. We all know people 
pardon my expression, but we all know people who live like hell and, and, and they don't want anything to do with church people. It's not God that they're mad at. They've seen things in people who, who represent religion that have hurt their heart, hurt their family. It's not God that they're mad at. They may say that they are. They may say that they don't agree, they don't believe. It's not God that they're mad at. It's the people who represent God. Where did Jesus go? He went to the people who were despised. He went to the, the people who, who were not buying into this thing of going to the synagogue and paying the, the tithes and doing the offerings and all the things that were the law of Moses. Tax collector. Now, the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear him. Is that not amazing? Jesus is talking to this ragtag group of people who are not the church people, not the religious people, and they couldn't get close enough to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes, that's the religious people. Well, they grumbled, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable, Jesus' words now, what man of you having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it. And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, just so. In other words, just like that, in the very same way, I'm telling you, there's going to be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Who's Jesus talking to? He's talking to tax collectors. He's talking to sinners. He's talking to people who have just been out there living their life. Maybe they didn't grow up in a world where, where God was represented to them in a way that was, was palatable. Maybe they grew up in a world where they were making their own decisions and, and they weren't bad people, but they made bad decisions and the bad decisions took them into bad places and they caused them to do bad things and now they've just considered these sinners. And Jesus shows up. And guess what? Amazingly enough, when Jesus spoke to those people, those people wanted to hear what Jesus had to say. Wow. They wanted to hear what he had to say. Jesus, in turn, says, let me just go to your house today. Can I ask you a question? When's the last time that you took it upon yourself to think about the people that's in your life that, 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 that maybe they could fall into that category of tax collectors and sinners? When's the last time you took one of those out to grab a cup of coffee? When's the last time you took one of them and said, let's sit down over some chips and salsa? When's the last time you invited one of them into your home? When's the last time? You asked them to come sit beside you at church. You know what those people are? The people that you're picturing in your mind, they're not bad people. They could just be lost. And how are they going to find their way? Jesus went to where they were. Where they were. Uh, what, what do you see in the story? What did, what, he, he says the, the guy who has 100 sheep and he loses one, what does he do with the one when he finds it? Well, first of all, he does find it. First of all, he, go, he leaves the 99. And nothing else is as important as my lost sheep. I have got to find this sheep. i got to know where it is. He, go, he, he moves heaven and earth, gets to where the thing is. And when he finds it, what does he do? He puts it on his shoulders. He puts it on his shoulders. He cares about this thing. You, you've been out here struggling for so long. No doubt you're exhausted. No doubt you're starving. No doubt you just need some, some human contact. Let me put you on my shoulders. I can carry you to where you need to be. That's what Jesus does. And then when he does that, he goes into town and, and he takes care of the, the sheep and he tells all of the neighbors, I found my sheep. I found the one that was lost. And they all rejoice together. Are you hearing what I'm saying today? All of heaven rejoices when some one, not a hundred, not a thousand, one lost sinner comes to Jesus. Maybe you are that lost sinner today. Maybe you are the one that someone's been praying for that, that you would come to that place. Maybe you are the one today who God is going to prick your soul. God is going to pierce your heart to get people into his place. He says there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents and over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Well, what does it mean to be lost? That's a great question, man. Um, not someone that's bad. It just means I, I, I can't find my way. I'm out here on my own. 
and spiritually speaking, before we get too high and mighty and, and, and self-righteous, come on now, before we get too all put together here in church this morning, every last stinking one of us was lost until Jesus found us. Not nary a one of us, if you know what Rutherford County means, but not nary a one of us brought ourselves out of the pit. God found us and got us out of a hole that we could not get out of. God did that for us. Um, we're all lost. Well, why are we lost? What, what does it mean to be lost? That's a great question. The reason every one of us is lost is a word that, that our modern culture doesn't like to use, but it, it still stands nonetheless. The reason we're lost is because of our very own personal sin. That's the word. Sin always separates. What is sin? Well, God wants us to live a perfect life, but none of us are capable of doing that. And so when we sin, that decision to sin, the first time you sin, shoo, your connection with God was severed. And sin separates you from God. And the longer you stay in a state of sin, the more distant you become from God, the more distant he becomes from you. And the reason we're lost is because we were, we were not designed to be out there in this world all on our own. We were designed to be connected with God so that he could show us the way. But when we sever that connection with him, now we're lost, now we're wandering, now we can't find our way. On our own, we are wandering. Now, some of y'all are probably not old enough to remember what it's like to actually wander, but people of a certain age will remember what it was like when you tried to go somewhere and you didn't know how to get there. What are we going to do? Well, we might take a map, but most of the people I know never had a real clue about how to read the thing anyway, right? So what did you do? Okay, you rode until you realized you didn't know where you were, and then a gas station shows up, and you send your wife in, and she comes back, and what she tells you makes no sense. You don't understand, so you get out mad already, go in, ask the man, look, bro, I'm trying to get, I'm trying to get down to da 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 How do I get there? And he gives you eight instructions, and as he starts telling you, just go back out here, take a right, go down to the light, Anything he tells you past that, you're not going to remember. But he carries on. Go to the light, and you're going to see that red barn, you know, the one with the big oak tree behind it. Go behind that. They threw those pumpkins. I don't know why they keep growing pumpkins. They never sell any of these things. Go on past about two and a half miles, three miles, and you're going to see the school turn left. You had heard none of it. So you go as far as you can, and then you find another gas station. You ask somebody else, right? Yeah. Anybody remember that frustration? You remember that? What was the thing that saved us from having to do all of that? GPS. Come on, can we just give praise to God right now for creating a GPS in this world? Come on, man. You got your little GPS, and now all of a sudden that little sweet voice is in your car telling you just follow the blue line, turn here, turn there. You get busy singing a song at the top of your lungs and, and miss the turn, and she sweetly redirects you to the next turn anyway. Don't even fuss at you about missing it. That's what it's like living with God directing your life, the Holy Spirit living inside of you. Do you want to live lost, stopping every little bit, turning around, realizing you went 22 miles out of the way and now got to backtrack? Come on, don't raise your hand, but if you know, you know. How many of you know in your life you've spent years, don't raise your hand, you've spent years going in the wrong direction because you made the decision of where you were going to go rather than listening to where God wants you to go. The Holy Spirit will take you where he wants you to go, but you got to quit being so doggone stubborn and hard-headed and let him tell you. Let him tell you. God wants great things for you. He wants to show you the way. Well, here's a couple of questions. How can I know if I'm lost? How can I know if I'm lost? Remember now, don't check out on me. Don't check out on me thinking, well, I know I was saved back in 1984 because I raised my hand and I went to the front and I was baptized. If you are depending, come on now, if you are depending for all of your eternity on something that you did, you've missed the boat. Salvation is about what Jesus did. Doesn't matter how many times you've been dunked in a trough. Doesn't matter how many times you've prayed a prayer. If you've never surrendered your life through faith, it is by grace that we have been saved through faith. And this is not of yourselves. It's a free gift from God so that no one can boast. He even gives you the grace to believe. It even gives you the faith to believe. If you're believing in anything other than the finished work of Jesus Christ at the cross of Calvary, then you're depending on yourself. But if you know that you've been saved, then we've got some work to do. If you have questions about that today, guess what? You're in great company. You're not the only person in this room. If you're feeling this way, you, I promise you, you are not the only person in this room that's saying to themselves right now, am I really saved? 
If you have questions, God wants you to have answers. Let me run through a couple of things. How can I know if I'm lost? Well, here's one thing. I consider myself to be fiercely independent. Now, you don't see that in a Bible verse, but think about that. If I'm lost, maybe I consider myself to be fiercely independent. Maybe you think about that, and let's just be 100 here. There may be a reason that you've become fiercely independent. Maybe people have done things to you, and you've decided, if I don't take care of me, nobody will. Well, maybe you don't know about the Jesus who wants to take care of you. Being independent is only good up to a certain point. We all need our relationship with God. So that's one indicator. Second indicator, maybe I am wandering with a lack of direction. Maybe I'm wandering through my life with a lack of direction. You know, wandering indicates that you're trying to figure out a path. And you can try to figure it out, but when you look back over a season of your life, or multiple seasons, and the decisions that you've made over and over have led you to make decisions that turned out not to be good, and your life stays jammed up because of the bad decisions that you make, you might be lost and not be listening to the Word of God that wants to clearly take you in a direction. You weren't created to have to figure it out all on your own. Here's another reason, another thing that might indicate that you're lost. I do not have a personal relationship with God. Now, again, please hear me say this, guys. This is not some kind of thing to condemn anyone. This is not some, just because I'm up on this platform, think I'm high and mighty. This is, this is saying, I want to give you tools to diagnose, self-diagnose. Where am I? Well, if you, if you consider yourself a person who goes to church, you consider yourself a person who, who maybe is somewhat religious, does religious activities, it doesn't matter how many religious activities you do if you don't have a daily personal relationship with the God who created you. Being a saved person, being a follower of Jesus, means that, that, that you are constantly learning how to get closer to him. You're reading his word, right? A person who loves Jesus and is allowing him to be Lord should have a desire to want to read his word, should have a desire to want to pray, should have a desire to want to do the things that God calls us to do. But if you don't have a personal relationship with God, if your relationship with God is just purely a religious activity, and you don't have that relationship, might be an indication that you're lost. God does not want that for you. He wants you to hear today that that can all be remedied. Last thing here, maybe I live in a manner that is not in line with Scripture. A lost person might live with, with, with phrases like, well, I know what the Bible says, but. Well, if I know what the Bible says, if I know that God's telling me to live a certain way, and I'm surrendering my life to let Jesus be the Lord of my life, then why am I going to choose the, the road for my life? Why am I going to choose to do things the way I want to do when God clearly is telling me that the way that he will protect me and provide for me and give me his very best is this way? If I know what the Bible says, why would I not do that? Why would I not do that? It's like knowing that the GPS is telling you to go in a certain direction. Say, no, I'm not, I'm not doing that. And then you end up wandering, stubborn, making the same mistakes, same decisions over and over. So here's another question. What are the dangers of being lost? I mean, that's pretty, pretty self-evident. But here, here's a few things. Number one, um, I will only depend on myself to make things happen. I will only, and, that, and that's where, you know, sometimes we get lost and we get stubborn and we're like, no, I'm not stopping and asking for directions. Even though that brother in that convenience store has lived there for 48 years and knows every road in town, if you were to ask him, he could quickly tell you how to get somewhere. God knows how to live your life. God knows, God doesn't just want you to live your life and see what happens. God has a plan to get you from here to where he wants to take you, and he knows how to get you there, and he wants you to know that. But if you're stubborn, and you decide, I'm going to only do it my way, God will allow you, and you will continue to wander. Here's another thing. I will not find my way and the, find the purpose of my life if I choose to remain lost. God created you to live a life of joy and purpose and adventure. And if you are stubborn and refuse to accept Jesus as your Lord, chances are that you are going to wander around throughout your life trying to figure it out on your own. We all need God to, to guide us through this life. Here's another thing. I'm going quickly now. Uh, dangers of being lost is I have a severed connection with God, the source of my life. 
I have a severed connection with God. A couple of examples that come to my mind. One is, is if you go out into the garden and in the summer, you go out and there's a bean plant that's growing up out of the ground and it's doing great. And you reach down and pull that bean plant out by the root and just throw it down on the, on the soil. Come back about three days later. What's that thing look like? It's all withered up. It's dried up. The life has gone out of it. The life has now gone out of it, and, and, and it's not going to produce anymore, and it's just dying. Why? Because it's been cut off from its life source. You take a human being, sever an artery. Guess what happens when the blood flows out of that human being? The life, the, 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 the source of life for that person has now bled out, and that human being dies. Spiritually speaking, if you are lost, sin has severed your relationship with God. God does not want it to be that way. He's saying, I'm standing here with a tourniquet. I can bandage it. I can staple you back together. I can fix it all, but you got to let me do it. And you're saying, no, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. God says, what are we doing? That's a danger. That's a problem. And then the last thing here is I constantly live with the consequences of a life of sin. I live with the consequences. Every time we decide that I know what God says, and this is God's best, and this is God's way, yet I choose to do this, then there's consequences. And the consequences is, is you've heard me say this before. I mean, it's like the umbrella. God says, come under the umbrella. I'll protect you from the rain. I'll protect you from the storm. But if we want to run out from underneath the umbrella, now we're exposed. And sin always exposes us. Sin always puts us away from the plan of God. God doesn't want you to live that kind of life. So, where do we go with that? Well, my guess is that today some of you are struggling to find peace and joy and purpose and adventure in your life. Some of you are choosing to hold on to your own sin rather than letting go and saying, I'm going to surrender and submit my life to Christ. Others of you are not struggling with it at all. Some of you are hearing this today and you're saying right there in your seats right now, my guess is there's some of you that would say, how do I do this? I want to be saved. I don't want to stay st struggling. How do I do it? Well, I want to show you just a couple of verses here, and then we'll wrap up. How can I be saved? It's a, it's a progression. So Romans 3, verse 23, says, All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's kind of a, that's kind of a setup verse, okay? Every person who's ever lived has sinned, and we've all fallen short of the glory of God. So if you're thinking, the only reason we need to hear this verse today is if you're thinking that you don't need God, what he's telling you today is every person who's ever lived has sinned. And sin has separated every one of us from God, and we all need him. You say, well, okay, I know I've sinned, so what? What's the big deal? If everybody's done it, I have too. What's the big deal? Next verse, Romans 6, 23, says the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The wages of sin is death. The wages of your work is you go to work and they pay you money. You, you, you receive something for what you did. The wages of sin is you sin and you receive death. But the gift of God is Jesus Christ who, who steps in between me and my sin and he takes my sin away and he forgives me and he gives me Jesus rather than death. That's the good news. He wants you to know that there is eternal life. Romans 5, 8 says God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I love this verse. I love this verse. If you're struggling with your sin right now and you know that, that you've got a sin problem that continues to grow, please hear me say this. God is not waiting on you to clean up your mess so that he can then become the Lord of your life. God is, not, God is not in love with some future version of you. He loves you right now just as you jacked up are, just as you messed up are, just as you are. He loves you. And while we were still sinners, God still loved us. He loved the tax collectors. He loved the sinners. God even loved the Pharisees and the scribes. He loved all of them. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. How can I be saved? Romans 10, 9. If you confess with your mouth, that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, Romans 10, 9 says you will be saved. Before you jump on that too quickly, when it says when you believe, you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, say stop, 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 stop right there. You need to understand what a Lord is. You're not just saying that I believe that Jesus lived and died and went to a cross and went to heaven. You're saying I believe that Jesus is Lord, and when Jesus is Lord, then you are not Lord anymore. 
When Jesus is Lord, he lays out the, 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 the framework for your life. He lays out the map for your life. He has the ability and the freedom to tell you how to live your life, and you have a responsibility to live it that way. I believe that Jesus is Lord, which means that I'm going to surrender. I'm going to climb down off of the throne of my heart and let Jesus lead me in that. That's the first thing he says. And then he says, if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. What's that saying? It's saying I'm, I'm, I'm placing all of my faith in what Jesus did. I can't do it myself. If I could have done it myself, I would have done it a long time ago. I would have done it a long time ago. And that's where I want to make an invitation to you today. Today you have an opportunity. You have an opportunity to make a great decision. See, here's the thing, guys. God wants to save you today. If you have never been saved, God wants to save you today. It's one thing to be out there wandering around, not knowing where you're going and being lost. It's another thing to live a life that is completely wrecked, completely wrecked. If you imagine your, your life as a vehicle that you're driving in, some of you know what this feels like, man. You've been driving this vehicle of your life for so long, and yet there have been times where you've made wrong turns and you've wandered and years and seasons and whatever have gone and relationships have been destroyed and, and physical problems have come. Because, yeah, that's one thing. I'm not even talking about that. What about when you're driving the vehicle of your life and you run completely off the rails, flip that thing, it rolls down to the bottom of the ravine. Nobody knows you're there. Your life is upside down. Your life is wrecked. And you're screaming and crying and hollering and calling out. And no one's coming. What's going to happen? If no one comes, you're going to perish. If no help comes, you're not going to make it. And God is saying to you today that we don't play around with this thing of being lost because being lost is in a life that's upside down and wrecked and broken. And it's helpless and it's hopeless without Jesus. What I'm saying to you today, though, is that if your life is in that place, wrecked and upside down and broken, there is a Savior who has just come down off of the highway. He heard your call. He knows where you are, and He knows how jammed up your life is, and He's made His way down to you, and He's saying to you today, hey, I have everything I need to get you out of here. Do you want me to get you out? See, here's the thing. He's not going to just pull you out because He wants to. He's going to ask you, And if you believe that he can pull you out, and if you want him to pull you out, he will do it. But here's the thing. He's not going to just pull you out and let you go back to the way things were. When he pulls you out, there's a stipulation. And the stipulation is that when I pull you out, we're going to go back up on the road. And you've been driving this thing around getting it lost your whole life. How about you let me sit in the driver's seat? How about you let me drive? And you just sit over here and you rest. And you heal, and you let me take you to where you need to go because I can get you there, and you obviously can't. That's what Jesus wants you to hear today. He wants to be in the driver's seat in your life, and he's a much better driver of your life than you will ever be. Here's your invitation this morning. Jesus is inviting you into salvation. Every head bowed, every eye closed right now. What a serious moment. Father, your word is alive and active, and your word is piercing hearts right now. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And the lamp is showing us that you are here. The light is is illuminating a path that says, I need to follow you wherever you're going. Lord, right now, your children are hurting. Some of your children here today have been lost and wandering for so long. And you have come to this place through your holy word. And you've spoken to them today saying, I love you and I am here and I want to rescue you from your wrecked life. And you're making the offer to them. And now it's up to them. Holy Spirit of God, I ask you in this moment to lead people into a step of faith, a step of salvation. Now, with every head bowed and every eye closed right now, with no one looking around, it's just you and God doing business. God came here today to meet with you. 
God has extended an invitation to you. He may not come back. You may never hear this invitation again. But you're hearing it right now. And today you have an opportunity to respond. If you're very unclear about whether or not you're saved, chances are you've never understood it. Maybe you, maybe you are in a place right now where you know you're not saved. The invitation has been extended to you. I, I'm not going to embarrass you in any way. God wants to make it easy for people to come to him. How do we do that? We do that through prayer. We do that through communicating, talking with God. So with every head bowed, every eye closed, no one looking around, right now, if you're saying, Jeff, I get it. I know God is making me this offer, and I want to take him up on it today. I want to give him my life. I want Jesus to save me. You just raise your hand right now. Say, Jeff, pray for me. I want that. I want to take hold of it. Would you raise your hand if you want Jesus to save you? My God, yes, I see that hand. Yes, I see this hand on the other side. See that hand in the middle there? Is there anybody else? I'm about to pray. Yes, I see you back there. I see you on the side. There. Yep. I see five hands raised. God said we would rejoice over one who comes to him. Father, right now, you hear the hearts of your people who are saying, God, I'm desperate. God, I'm desperate. I can't do it on my own. God, I don't want to do it on my own. I need hope. And I may not know all the theology behind it. I may not understand everything. But I know that I'm lost. And I need you. Jesus, for these hands that have been raised right now, will you just walk them into that? Will you just walk them into that? If you raise your hand, would just in your mind, between you and God, you don't have to say this out loud. This is between you and him. He said if we would confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, would you just tell him right now, just, you, just inside your mind, just pray, Jesus, I believe that you are Lord. I believe that you died and rose again for me. I want you to be in the driver's seat of my life. I'm asking you to take away my sin. Forgive me for my past. And I believe right now, right now, I believe that right now you are making me whole. Right now you're taking me out of that old life and you're putting my feet on the highway that you want me to be on. No longer am I a lost sinner, but now I'm in the passenger seat and you're driving and you take me where I need to go. Jesus, you are my Lord. Jesus, you are my Savior. Jesus, I give you my life and I'll never be the same. I'm not turning back. Jesus, take hold, take over. God, I thank you. I thank you for the miracle of salvation. There is no word that any preacher could come up with. It's only through your holy, holy word, God. It's only through your Holy Spirit that any lost person could be saved. But today, you have come to this place, and you are saving lost souls. Jesus, for those of us who you have already rescued at some time in the past, God, give us a burden for people we know that are far from you. We're not judgmental. We're not self-righteous. We're just looking around and seeing where people are struggling. And your word tells us that you had compassion on the masses. Help us to be people who have compassion. Help us to make room for you, God. God, right now, as we continue our worship, I pray that you'll continue to work. I believe that you're not finished here yet. You still have work to do. Do your thing, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.